just in the time I've been on this earth, technology has changed dramatically since when I was a kid, I remember the old loose hay and everything was done with horses. Now it's powerful air conditioned tractors. This is happening just across the road from the house that we're fixing up in hopes of renting at Woodbury. And so we look out there every now and then and see how they're coming. First they combine the, they cut the grass down, let it dry a while, then they combine the seeds out of it. And now it's at the stage where they're picking up the straw and they'll put store this straw in a big shed and then a lot of it gets shipped overseas for use as they make an animal animal feed out of it and various other things so it's not going to waste nor being burned like it used to. One person on a tractor like this can do the work that it would have taken several guys many days to do in the past but this is all automated they just drive up to the bale they don't even have to stop and it slides up and these are huge bales too. The bales are put in temporary stacks out in the field and then within a few hours a big truck will move out there and they'll all be loaded on the truck and hauled to a shed where they'll be stored till they're sent overseas or wherever they send it. The big powerful truck has gone out and picked up a load of this and he'll haul it just a short distance to a place where they'll store it until they ship it someplace else. Mount Hood is barely visible in the hazy skies of today and the big building Amazon's building still going up but we're getting ready to head up to Oregon City and see what the founders of Oregon were in for and how they lived. So we're going to take the drive right through Oregon City across the Willamette River and then we can look upstream just a short distance from this bridge and see Willamette Falls and that is the second largest fall in our nation. It's not too tall but it has a lot of volume of water going over it. So it's second only to Niagara Falls. And then there's the elevator and that elevator was put here to get you up over the cliffs since there are numerous cliffs in Oregon City an elevator sure seemed like a good idea it's green Tom it's green we're traveling through the old historical part of Oregon City down next to the Willamette River it's green! No, but... Oh, stay on mile. Turn yeah. left onto Tumwater Drive. Stay on the left. And we finally made it to the Oregon State Territorial Museum overlooking the Willamette Falls. Marge goes in and starts looking at the pins. One of the volunteer women that work here has made all the Marge will look through these and find her a map she likes. She has always 
love maps and so she can get a pin and just wear it on her all the time. That way she won't be wearing my paper maps out that are in the car. The first settlers that moved up the Willamette River till they came to the falls were trying to think of what they should do with them. They had definite potential to, for factories and uh, all sorts of other things. And even there was a woolen mill here at one time. And they, do, they even uh, generate electricity from the falls and run a huge, they used to run a huge paper mill here too. It was in operation from 1910 to 1930 and they made some really, really nice things. And of course, every village or city had to have a blacksmith shop and Oregon City was no exception. It was used to repair things and build tools that the pioneers needed for their day-to-day -day activities. And then some very heavy equipment that was used for mining and of course logging. That was one of the big deals around this area since trees grew seven times faster than they do back east. Logging has always been a big deal around Oregon. And talk about trees. They were some of the biggest giant trees that a lumber mill has ever sunk their saw into, grown right here around Oregon City. And of course they'd have to have a flour mill. The settlers would bring their wheat down and have it ground, and then they would go in the back room and pick out the color of sack they wanted the wheat to be put in. And then when they get home, they usually dump it up into cans and make clothing out of the wheat. And I guess everyone's familiar with a crosscut saw. Those one man on each side, and they could saw a tree down and buck it up. And then if you wanted to work in a factory, you probably had to deal with one of these time machines where you'd clock in and clock out. And if you were to become ill, you'd wait for the arrival of one of these little carts, which brought the doctor to you. You didn't go to the doctor, they came to you. He came to you. And then he had all kinds of instruments, even a magnifying glass and all sorts of inhalers and all kinds of pills to make you all better. It was said that unless the medicine tasted bad, that it was no good. And some of this medicine must have been really good because it sure as heck doesn't taste good. There's all kinds of things here that the doctor would have used. There's even a scale and uh, all sorts of other medical equipment that would have been used on you. The boots and harness and spurs you used to climb tools. This would have been the lineman's tools that furnished electricity to us. And they generated plenty of it in this little shed right down under Willamette Falls. The shed may not still be here, but you can look out the, r the window of the museum and see the Willamette Falls is still well and doing good as we see it roaring down over the cliffs and spilling back into the Willamette River down below us with a huge paper mills and all sorts of factories along the edge of it that would have been originally put here to utilize the power of the waterfall. Then some giant lathes. I don't know what they made on these, but it must have been big. They could make anything they wanted, probably a lot of the tools 
for the paper mill were made on this very forge. And then since Oregon City had electricity in the early days, how about a nice electric range and even an electric wash machine? That would be really good to have. The museum is situated up here on a tall bank where you can look out the river and see the Willamette Falls down below you and all sorts of industrial buildings down along the Willamette River. And the old Willamette Post Office is in here. And I can almost smell the way those old post offices used to smell, just like letters. And if you got one that some sweet girl's written her boyfriend, it'll probably be doused in perfume. There were lots of Native Americans lived here. They lived near the falls because it was a great spot to fish. And so they could catch salmon and eel and sturgeon, and most anything they'd want. And so the Indians had to have trade beads. To, the settlers gave them beads for things that they wanted to trade for. And these beads, a lot of them were made in Italy around 1850. Some of the earlier glass beads were made in China Major before they started getting them from the glass beads from Italy. And these were handmade but extremely beautiful. The blue and white beads were real popular in Oregon and they were highly polished and the Native Americans really loved them. And, and then the fishing tools, nets and things to harvest the eel with. And I think these eel are still harvested. Only the Native American people are harvesting these eel. And these eels suck to a salmon and ride him up till they get into fresh water a ways. And then they're off on their own to spawn. And so here's some of the tools the Native Americans used for fishing right at Oregon City Falls on the Willamette River. And then how about a nice buckboard to ride in? Not only were a buckboard all right to ride in, but you had lots of room to carry a lot of whatever you wanted in it. And there's a pitchfork made out of wood and several other tools that would be common around the farm. A side for cutting your wheat or grain or, or hay or whatever you wanted to cut. Then the Native Americans had the desire to make petroglyphs, those faces in stone. And so there's some of these pictures of petroglyph in the museum. And they dug a lot of the camas root with a digging stick like this. And I think it's made of a stick run through an elk antler. And the women were the ones that was woman's work to dig the camas. And they were used for food. If you were to dig camas roots, you need to be real careful because there is the death camas. I'm not certain it's around here, but it would be something you definitely wouldn't want to even try. And then all sorts of other stuff in the showcases that the Indians would have used in their day-to-day -day life. Some really neat decorated mortar and pedestal bowls made carved from stone. It must have taken a long time to make one of these. And then other instruments they could have used for various different household tasks. The Native American women were extremely skilled basket weavers. And these baskets were made out of everything from cattails and other reeds and sedges that you would find along a river bank or in a swampy area. And they would harvest these and pound them 
and weave some very beautiful baskets. And if you have one of these native baskets, they're worth a bundle now. And more stone tools. These tools don't look like they would have been made in five minutes. They're made out of polished basalt and extremely nice. Real craftsmen must have made these. Since there's plenty of stones around Oregon City, they made their artwork in stone. This is etched deeply into some of the native stone right here around Oregon City. And that's what we call a petroglyph. And then more mortars and pedestals. And this is a piece of the meteorite that landed in Oregon City. And there was a big controversy over who owned it. And I don't remember how it turned out. This man tried to claim it for his own, but I don't think that it worked out the way he had it planned. But anyway, the important thing is they've got a little piece of it at the museum. And if you're not interested in anything else, you should be interested in that, something from outer space in the museum at Oregon City. Then how about a ship's anchor? Oregon City is within the tidal area. The falls, the tide comes clear to Oregon City Falls. And then how about the battleship, the Oregon City, and even the brass bell off from it? Oregon City was considered the end of the Oregon Trail, so there's a lot of things happened here and went on here that helped shape our nation and particularly Oregon and the Western United States. It was one of the more important places on the map. And you're probably not going to get that far in this world unless you go to school. And here's exactly what the schoolhouses looked like. I remember those old desks. They had an inkwell in it. And when the girl was sitting ahead of me, had long pigtails, I could dip it in the inkwell. And there's some of the dresses the women wore. And the school marm, of course, had to be dressed in a fine. And if they're going to build a city at Oregon City, first you have to have a surveyor and uh, a few instruments, a carpenter's level and a few other things and a transit. And the wooden piece on the pedestal in the background was a witness tree. They would carve information that the surveyors would understand into the wood of a tree. And some of these trees still have them today. Apparently something happened to this tree so they saved the witness pole. And then there was always a big rock worked well, and they'd carve the information into the big rock about a corner or whatever. And so the surveyors were very important in the settlement of a land and also the court. This is the witness chair. And this lady looks like she's lost her head in there. But she's going to be there and testify and in the old courthouse. And there's where the old judge sat. He must have wiggled around a little to wear the chair out like that. And then if you were really bad, they fit you with a ball and chain, which you had to wear all the time. And then back to the pharmacy and it, there's plenty of pills to make you all better no matter what you've got. And I'm sure every one of them tasted absolutely horrible. I remember that old cod liver oil my mom used to try to pour down us and it was pretty awful. And then there's even some hemp seed here and I'm not sure what they used it for, but they ground it up and used it for something in healing process and then there's this it looks like a hippies uh, marijuana smoking pipe 
but I think it was probably something that was uh, that was used to smell vapor like if you had a really bad cold or pneumonia sometimes vapor would help a little bit in those situations and I think that may have been what it was for but I'm not certain and I guess I forgot to read the caption. There were all sorts of instruments used here and I guess a magnifying glass they could figure out what was wrong with you. And then there's that black and white floor tile and Marge says she hates that, that they had that in their house when she was a kid and she was the one that had to scrub it and she said they were always coming up and they'd have to put them back down and scrub them anyway. And then all sorts of, of bottles of, of medicine. And some of that may not have been too wholesome of stuff. And then if you're really sick, you make your own capsules. You grind the material up and put it in a little capsule. And here's where the Native American this is sort of a replica of their house, and you can see all kinds of implements. They had a lot of things in their house, and these houses were very skillfully split out of cedar rod and fixed together. And then there's an image of Dr. McLaughlin in stained glass just at the entrance to the building. It's out of an old Catholic church. We're out of time on this video, but next week we'll have a bunch on Dr. McLaughlin, and it's very good. It'll be on next Tuesday at about 4. I'll even talk with a person whose great-grandpa actually dealt with Dr. McLaughlin.